Um, we have a lot of ground to cover today, uh, so here's the general plan. Uh, we'll start with uh, defining the scope of what we'll cover, uh, followed by discussion about software architecture and APIs as it relates to audio for various operating systems. We'll also talk briefly about some of the software abstraction layers that are available and um, before concluding. Hope we have some time for questions. Uh, the slides are numbered, so in case you want to refer to them during questions if you have time, uh, that would be good. So, okay, so uh, this shows uh, general use cases for audio on a desktop or a mobile system. Uh, for playback cases, the audio source can be coming from a file from the web uh, through some communication software, or maybe the audio is being generated uh, by uh, music synthesis, speech synthesis, or maybe a, a game engine. Um, basically, the application would read the data, decode it, so it can be provided to some audio API. The API layer then sends this to a device driver uh, via some operating system layers in most cases. The driver then sends this data down to the device, which is usually connected over a bus of some sort. Uh, for capturing, it's a similar case. The path is, is reversed, uh, and we may end up uh, sending the data again to a file over communication or some other place. Uh, there are also cases where an application may actually want to play back the captured data uh, for monitoring, mixing, uh, perhaps with some processing. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus uh, on the audio APIs and the device driver layers only. So um, uh, further, I, want to limit, I wanted to limit the scope uh, since this can become huge. So I'll be covering only the typical use cases uh, concerning audio only, not talking about MIDI or mixing. Um, and mostly we'll be talking about dealing with PCM audio using C or C++ APIs, um, mostly lower level APIs. Uh, I will not cover effects processing or device connect, disconnect, plug and play sort of issues. Uh, overall, the amount of detail I'm going to present is going to be limited. Uh, I have provided references where you can get more details and specific uh, specifics if there is a need. So um, uh, talking about drivers, since uh, different devices have different ways of talking to the software, we need a mediator of some sort. Uh, the driver is the mediator between the host software and the, and the hardware uh, device. On one side, uh, we will call it the top layer, the driver talks to the OS, and on the other side, the driver talks to the device, we will call it the bottom layer. Uh, top layer has to be generic, so any, uh, any application can talk to it. Uh, the bottom layer is device specific because this is, this, the driver is for a specific device. Uh, the driver may need to go through other operating system layers to reach the device. Um, uh, it's, it's this layer which deals with uh, device data transfers, interrupts, or polling. Uh, mostly these drivers are kernel components, although that is changing now with, more, uh, with some models at least requiring the driver to be in the user mode. Um, so let's begin uh, how things happen on Windows. Uh, as you can see on the left, a Windows application has multitude of options to talk to audio devices. Uh, but out of these, there are certain set of APIs which are called the core audio APIs. Um, other APIs depend on these core, core audio APIs to provide their services. Um, on the right side, as you can see, uh, Windows has an audio engine. It, this is a protected service that runs all the time which gets audio from various applications and mixes this before sending to the kernel components. The audio engine also does things like format conversion, sample rate conversion, uh, enforcement for DRM policies. Uh, it may also need to do up-down mi mixing and, and sometimes also system-wide effects processing. Um, note that it is possible for applications to talk directly to the kernel components via something called an exclusive mode but, but that's not really recommended. So uh, now talking at the kernel level uh, in the architecture, 
Uh, all Windows devices are exposed as something called kernel streaming objects. These are very similar to direct show concepts of filters and pins and nodes and connections. Uh, most of the KS API is exposed by Microsoft provided components, uh, the KS.sys and some related class drivers. The device specific parts are written as tiny mini port drivers or mini drivers. Uh, there, as you can see, there are different uh, flavors of these mini ports and mini drivers. Uh, Microsoft now recommends using the WaveRT flavor for most new drivers. Uh, we'll see soon why. Uh, a number of devices still use the other driver flavors. Uh, in particular, the AV stream is recommended for devices which combine audio and video functionalities. Um, although the original uh, USB audio class, that's audio class one driver, is also AV stream, uh, uh, the new audio class, the audio class two driver from Microsoft, is now actually WaveRT. Um, stream class is there, but it's uh, deprecated. It's for, it was the precursor to AV stream. Um, the device specific parts, uh, the device specific drivers, then of course, uh, once again, talk to uh, one of the bus drivers to reach the devices. Um, just a few more things about Windows architecture. Um, the WinMM and Direct Sound APIs, they are, uh, they are deprecated, but they are still available uh, for compatibility reasons, like a lot of thing, other things with Microsoft APIs. Um, in addition to the audio engine, there are two additional services that are always running. There is the audio endpoint builder, which discovers and sets up audio endpoints. And there is the audio service. Uh, all kernel drivers, uh, in addition to, to this, the audio service provides things like ducking if, uh, if uh, communication uh, session is starting, it needs to reduce the, the level of, say, a music player, things like that. It also does things like stream setup and control. Uh, in addition to, to this, all kernel drivers uh, have to be digitally signed. And in addition to that, uh, if the device needs to be able to play DRM protected content, then the driver also has to be uh, WHQL certified. That's a special certification that Microsoft gives to drivers which have passed uh, certain checks. So let's see how uh, the actual transfers work from driver to the, to the device. Um, so this shows how a wave cyclic driver would work, a uh, wave cyclic mini port driver would work. Uh, a kernel streaming client, which is typically the audio engine, uh, submits audio uh, for playback through an IOCL. The port CLS class driver then enqueues these buffers to an internal FIFO and returns immediately. Uh, now at the same time, uh, we are assuming playback is going on on the device. So once the device has consumed a certain amount of uh, data which was pre previously sent, it raises an, an interrupt signal or it, the driver receives a callback from one of the lower layers. Uh, the mini port driver notifies the port class about this completion of data. The port class then dequeues the block which was queued in the FIFO and instructs the mini port to copy the data to the device buffer. Uh, at the same time, uh, the port class driver also informs the case client, we are done with this data, so you can uh, send us more data. Uh, the mini port, on the other hand, copies the data to the device buffer in uh, whatever mechanism it needs to. And so this keeps on going on. Capture is very similar in, in reverse direction, except the queue uh, that is submitted, it's a queue of buffers that need to be filled, which will be filled, and then the application will be notified. Uh, so the Wave PCI, which is the other flavor of Miniport, is very similar here, except that there is no need for actual copying, uh, because the port class driver provides a physical address of the buffer which contains the data. And the Miniport driver then forwards this physical address uh, to the PCI device, or it may be other device, um, so essentially, this is more efficient as there is less copying involved. Uh, but this does require that the PCI device, which we are working with, be capable of reading data from any location in physical memory, even if that buffer is crossing physical page boundaries. 
sometimes this is not, um, not possible or too expensive for the device to implement. And so these restrictions can require a driver to use one of the other models, either they use wave cyclic or preferably the new wave RT model. And this is the wave RT uh, model. This is what Microsoft recommends. And this is uh, essentially much more uh, efficient because here there is no need to queue or copy the data. The KS client initially would request a pointer to the device buffer. Uh, this would be shared memory and then copies the da data directly there. The mini port driver keeps informing uh, the, the port class about the device progress. That is where the device is reading the data from in the buffer. And from time to time, this allows the KS client to write in appropriate location of the, of the buffer that it has already received. Uh, this is the recommended model to follow. And this also allows for much lower latencies. So uh, let's talk about how an application accesses uh, audio APIs. Uh, I'm going to restrict the discussion here, uh, only talking about the lower level APIs, in particular the, the Wasapi, which is the, wind, uh, which is the audio session API. Uh, this is part of the core, core audio APIs that we talked about. Um, the, and this is exposed via, uh, uh, via COM, that's the component object model. Uh, so in terms of discovering devices, uh, Microsoft provides uh, a few interfaces. There is the uh, device enumerator and MM device inter interface. And the application can query, proper, uh, query the list of devices that are available and the properties for the devices through these APIs. Uh, once, the, once the application has decided which IMM device it needs to work with, it, it prepares the device for streaming uh, by uh, activating uh, the interfaces which are used for streaming, which is the iAudio client and the iAudio render client interfaces. Uh, now, the, one of the options we do have is that the application can request exclusive mode access if it wants uh, lower latencies. But once again, if it's exclusive mode, then there is no sharing or mixing possible. Uh, now, uh, during streaming, uh, client can uh, it's possible for the client to use uh, event signaling. So it would have provided an event which gets signaled when more data is, uh, is required, or the application can run a timer to decide on when it needs to feed more data. And um, the, uh, once, the, once the callback or the event gets signaled, the uh, client would fill more data into the buffer, it would find out how much data is needed, and it would keep filling the data from there. Um, uh, now, since this is not a callback model where the application has to, has to uh, wait on events, then uh, setting up the thread priorities f is the application's uh, responsibility, and it's advisable to use the uh, multimedia class scheduler services to request uh, thread priority, which is suitable for for audio, this does dynamic priority boosting for the threads that are required. Uh, there is also the new real-time work queues. They can also be used. Um, now, there have been some improvements in Windows 10 for enabling lower latency playback and capture. Uh, in order to utilize this, first, the driver has to support the newer APIs, which allows smaller buffer sizes. And uh, in addition to that, the client also needs to use some new services which are provided by, by the iAudio client 3 APIs. So uh, now there are other APIs available on Windows uh, to access audio. Uh, there is something called AudioGraph. The nice thing about AudioGraph is this is based on the modern C++ WinRT interfaces. So it's also accessible from C Sharp or uh, from UWP applications. Uh, there is X-Audio 2. This is essentially a, a replacement of direct sound. This is based a lot on the Xbox audio APIs. Uh, through X-Audio, there is also something called X3D Audio. This can be used for 3D positioning. Uh, the way this works is you would specify the emitter and listener parameters, you know, where they are 
where the sound source is, where the listener is, and then the X3D uh, audio API uh, gives you information like uh, what should be the volume, pitch, reverb, or other filter parameters required, and then the application can set these on the X audio 2 objects. Now, there is also the KS API. Uh, this can be used to communicate directly to the drivers, but this is uh, not really recommended uh, because it's not documented very well. The documented is split across various places. Uh, there's some documentation in the DDK. You need to understand direct show. Um, so it's, uh, but it, it does allow you the, if you use the KS API, you can get the least possible uh, latency. Okay, so uh, the next we are going to talk about is the ASIO API. So ASIO is an audio driver architecture uh, and API which was created by Steinberg to meet the requirements of pro audio applications. These were not met by the uh, audio APIs that were available on both Mac OS, Mac OS 9, and Windows at the time. Uh, among other features, it, it assumes that the device is a full duplex device, so there is uh, no need to treat the record and uh, playback devices separately. It's a, it also assumes that there is support for a synchronous start and stop. Uh, it also works with non-interleaved data primarily, which is also suitable for pro audio applications. And it's, uh, it's designed to work directly with hardware. It tries to mimic whatever uh, uh, the device, at least in those days, mainly PCI devices uh, were providing. And uh, the nice thing is that there is no actual layering provided by the, by the architecture, by the, the, the drivers and the application communicate directly via COM interface. Uh, Steinberg does provide nice C++ wrappers if you want to choose, and it's, it's recommended that we, we use that. Uh, overall, this reduces CPU consumption and, uh, and also provides lower latencies. Um, uh, there, there are certain limitations. Uh, one limitation with the ASIO is this is the, the design assumes a single client design uh, single client use, meaning one application at a time would be using the device. Uh, it is possible to write a driver which can support multiple, multiple clients simultaneously, and it is now done by many devices. Uh, but as, a, as an application writer, you cannot assume that that's going to be the case. So there may be a case where uh, only one application can access the ASU device. So here's a picture that shows the simplicity of this interface. The uh, ASIO specification only talks about uh, user mode components. So the ASIO specification does not deal with the lower level, uh, lower layer communication. Uh, the, uh, on Windows, the ASIO driver is just uh, a DLL, and, and in most cases, it may, or it, it actually it does talk to its own kernel mode driver uh, using a private interface. Uh, the application, in this case, the application gets access to an ASIO buffer, much like the WaveRT case. Uh, the kernel driver then may use other bus drivers to talk to its devices. But the communication and streaming between the ASIO host and, and the driver is direct through these buffers. So let's see how the, the actual transfers work in ASIO. Um, again, as you can see, it looks a lot similar to WaveRT case. The client application retrieves buffer pointers uh, during preparation and during streaming. Whenever it gets notified to switch, it, it fills the data or reads data from one, one set of buffers while the device is reading from, from another set of buffers. So you know, this is the case of one buffer switch. This would be how it would say, switch to the other, and then again it would switch to the other buffer. So this is how the transfers work in case of ASIO. Um, and uh, in terms of how the API works, uh, for discovery, a client would use uh, a function called get driver names, uh, which would list the available ASIO drivers on the system. And then it can use various ASIO get functions. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, so it, would, uh, it can query things like 
what are the buffer sizes supported, how many channels are, are there, what format is required, what's the latency and that the device uh, reports, things like that. Uh, in terms of preparation, uh, the application would set the sample rate to use, uh, and then it would request the driver to create buffers for transfers, and, and basically the driver would provide two buffers, the, the index zero buffer, index one buffer, uh, which are used to transfer the data. Uh, and then, of course, it calls ASIO start, and it starts streaming. Uh, while the streaming is happening, uh, there is the callback which specifies, which tells the application which half it needs to, to read from or write to while the other half is being accessed by the device. Um, so that's, again, fairly straightforward. The callback can also uh, specify uh, timing information like time code and when exactly the switch happened. This uh, can help application be more precise. Um, while there is streaming going on, it's possible for the ASIO host to register for notifications. So it would get um, it would get notifications if there was a device reset, if there is a requirement to resync uh, streaming, uh, if the user changed the buffer size from a control panel, for example, or if there was an overload indicated. Uh, all of these uh, are available through the ASIO API. One thing that ASU API doesn't support is ability to, to know when a new device was connected or devices are disconnected. Typically, when a device is disconnected, you'd get something like reset, and then when you try to open it, it would fail in some way. Okay, moving on to macOS. Um, once again, there are multitude of APIs available. Uh, the core audio HAL APIs, uh, API, that's the lower level API, the AU Hell uh, wraps some of the things over Core Audio Hell without really adding much overhead, and so this makes it easy to, to access the devices. Uh, macOS also has an audio server running. Uh, this is running in a sandbox. The role of the server is mainly to mix audio from, from all applications that are using this device, and it sends uh, the mixed audio to the drivers. Now, the drivers may be older IO audio family kernel extensions, which are now deprecated, uh, or they may be the newer user mode audio server plugins. Um, uh, the, the audio server plugins are running in user mode, but they will also ultimately need to uh, talk to some, some kernel code directly or indirectly to get to their devices. Uh, now, on the, on the application side, just like the AU HAL, uh, there, are, uh, there are other specialized versions of AU HAL. Mm -hmm. If you want to send your output to the default system output, say for playing alerts or notifications, or if you want uh, to send to the default device for general audio playback. Uh, the format conversion, sample rate conversion, and channel mapping, et cetera, all of these take place on the application process side before they are being sent to the to the audio server. So this is a little bit different from the Windows server case. Okay, uh, so here's the transfer model that's used by macOS, and it is, it, this is unique. It's not really used in, in other driver models uh, that I've seen. Um, now, the way this works is that the kernel extension, uh, the IO audio family kernel extension, it uses a fairly large cyclic sample buffer. Uh, the device needs, keeps on reading from this and playing the data. Only when it loops around the, uh, around the buffer, it would notify, uh, notify the driver that, okay, it has looped around. Uh, the driver then tells the IO audio engine, uh, providing a fairly accurate timestamp of when the wraparound occurred and what was the loop count. And, and basically, having these two pieces of information. This allows the core audio health to, to accumulate this data and build a very accurate predictive clock uh, so it's not jittery. And, and this allows the, the health or the core audio layers to know fairly accurately where the device is reading the data from at, at any given point in time. So you know, it knows about where the device cursor is. Um, uh, also, note that I've shown here IO audio family kernel extensions, but with the, with the newer, uh, newer model, 
the uh, extensions are replaced by the audio server plugin. But basically, this mechani mechanism of transferring audio would remain the same. Now, uh, the, there are a few nice things about this, this mechanism. Now, this mechanism allows multiple client applications to stream simultaneously to the same device while using different buffer sizes and mixing happens uh, without any problem. So uh, basically, uh, based on the buffer size that's being used, the HAL would schedule timeouts on real-time threads, uh, which call on the client to fill the buffers. Uh, for a specific time, the timestamp is provided in the callback. Uh, HAL then mixes this da data from the individual uh, application buffer to a point in the mix buffer that is one client buffer size ahead in the, in the mix buffer. Uh, and, and then it tells the driver to convert and copy the data that's already present in the mix buffer, which has been accumulated from various applications to the, to the actual sample buffer. The, the driver would do clipping and, and, and uh, conversion. The mix buffer is always floating point, 32-bit floating point, and the driver would then convert it to whatever format uh, it, is, uh, it, it, it needs to work with. Uh, now, the driver can also specify a safety offset so, uh, so the HAL would, would keep a minimum amount of gap uh, between where the actual cursor is and where the data will be written. Uh, this scheme allows for fairly low latencies without having to have uh, small buffer size or hardware interrupts occurring at a very high rate. Uh, so that's why this is, uh, this is unique. Um, now, uh, this model is fairly complicated. And I'm leaving out uh, certain details here, which are related to having a watchdog timer. What if the application was late in sending the data? And there is also an erase, uh, erase timer running. Uh, but in the, in the references section, I'm providing links to places where you can get more details uh, if required. Uh, also note that the IO audio family source is, is open, so you can also download and examine the source if you really want to understand this. Now, in terms of using the core audio APIs, uh, uh, discovery uh, of available devices and device uh, data is primarily done using uh, audio object get property data, which, through which you can query the list of devices available and their properties in order to, to prepare. Since I'm talking about using the AUHAL, you would instantiate uh, AUHAL component and then you would, again, set properties on the AUHAL component. Uh, the properties include specifying which device, playback and capture you want to use, what kind of buffer size you want to use, the, the format needed, uh, if there is going to be need for any format conversions, and, uh, uh, and it would also specify address of a callback function, so the, during streaming, uh, the callback can be called. So while data is streaming, the callback gets called, uh, and the callback uh, provides, uh, provides buffer lists, which are basically data buffers that you need to fill. Uh, if there is also capture going on, then the call, uh, code in the callback would make a call into audio unit render function and provide its own allocated buffer where the data can be filled in. Uh, so that's how streaming works. Uh, once again, you can get notifications about things that are happening. Uh, while streaming is going on. And the way to do is uh, simply by setting listeners on the properties that are exposed. So you can get information like if a device was disconnected, reconnected, if the uh, hardware sampling rate was changed, or if something else happened. So let's uh, now talk about Linux. The main audio API and driver model on Linux that's in use today is called uh, ALSA. Uh, ALSA provides a layer in the kernel, as well as a user mode library called libasound. The ALSA library then, uh, so an application would talk to the ALSA library. The ALSA library talks to the kernel ALSA layer, which then talks to the ALSA driver. And then the ALSA driver would talk to uh, the devices, perhaps involving other subsystems like PCI, USB, uh, or, or whatever. Now, uh, on Linux, most non-pro audio setups on Linux uh, also have a server running. It's uh, usually a Pulse Audio uh, server or daemon running. And, 
Yeah. Once again, the server can, can mix audio from other applications and perform other operations, such as doing some sort of effect processing before sending the audio to the real driver, once again, via the same ALSA library. Uh, note that having pulse audio is not a requirement. Applications can still work without pulse audio. They can talk directly to the devices through the, through the ALSA library. Uh, there are certain advantages to using pulse audio, including pulse audio also supports allowing sending the audio over the network to, to other, uh, other computers uh, running pulse audio for playback. Now, uh, if you are using pro audio applications, uh, then there is, uh, there is another popular uh, server called Jack. Uh, <coughs> and uh, note that in case of pulse audio, the redirection of the audio to, to pulse audio is automatic because pulse audio allow, because ALSA allows uh, a mechanism where you can redirect certain PCM streams directly to another location. If you're using Jack, that's not possible, or maybe through some additional layers of code. But basically, Jack provides its own API. Uh, you'd use the Jack API to send audio. The audio gets sent to the Jack daemon, and, and the Jack daemon then does mixing, or it can also do routing between applications. Um, and, and then this audio gets sent uh, once again to the, to the ALSA library, and then onwards to the ALSA, ALSA driver. Uh, it's also possible to use uh, use NetJack, which allows something similar to uh, to Pulse Audio, where you can send the audio to another machine on the network. Um, now, it is also possible to use both Jack and Pulse Audio uh, simultaneously on a machine, but that requires careful configuration, and things can go wrong easily there. Okay, uh, so this is how transfers work with Alsa. Uh, ALSA clients can transfer data in two modes. One is what is called the read-write mode. The other is the memory map mode. Uh, this picture here shows uh, the read-write mode. This is somewhat similar to what we saw with the wave cyclic uh, driver model in Windows. The client, queues, uh, the client first queries how much space is available and accordingly then writes the data to the ALSA library. Uh, this is then forwarded to the kernel module, and the kernel module forwards the data to the actual driver, which sends to the, to the device. And as the device progressing in consuming this data, it notifies, it notifies the, the ALSA layer. And this information is, again, forwarded up the stack, up the stack and the client can either receive a callback or, or it can get unblocked on, on some call. And then the cycle starts over. It finds out how much more data is available. And this is how the memory map mode transfer works. Uh, this, as you can see, is similar to the WebRT model. The client finds out about the device progress, and upon receiving callback, it requests direct access to the device buffer. Uh, it gets data pointers, and then it just fills the data. Uh, note that this is slightly different from, from ASIO model, in which there are always two buffers, and the buffer pointers are always with the host. Here, each time it needs to write the data, it needs to get the buffers. Um, so on, on ALSA, using uh, ALSA, you can either use the, the default output, in which case there is no discovery in, involved, or you would need to enumerate with APIs like SoundCard Next, SoundCard PCM Next device, and config search. Once you decide on which PCM interface you want to use, uh, and you would need to use separate interfaces for playback and recording, uh, you open the interfaces, and then you need to set hardware and software properties. Uh, these are required for which format you want to use, if you want to use the write, read, write, or, or the memory map mode, uh, and if whether you want a uh, callback function to be called. And once all of this is set up and started, then during streaming, if you have registered a callback, then you'd get get callback or you could block on, on some functions which will, which will unblock when there is, uh, there is space available uh, in the buffers. And once the space is available, you can read and write data. Or if you are in MMAP mode, then you get the buffer pointers for a little space and then write the data to the receipt buffers there. Um, okay, talking about Android. Uh, Android is uh, essentially Linux-based. 
so ALSA drivers are often used, uh, but Android has its own hell layer, so it's possible to have Android systems that do not actually use ALSA, but a proprietary driver model, it just needs to expose things as, as the hell is expecting. Um, and uh, on, on, in terms of uh, the audio APIs on newer versions, the lower level API is called A-Audio. Uh, on older systems, it's the OpenSL ES. Uh, but uh, what Google recommends is to use uh, another wrapper called Obo. Uh, Obo is a wrapper library which will automatically use A-Audio or OpenSLES depending on which system you're running on. In terms of architecture, the A-Audio normally accesses what is the, the native framework which, is, which consists of audio track and audio record uh, components via something called the legacy stream. But if that particular system supports uh, uh, memory map based access, then an MMAP stream is used uh, if, if going via the, the older legacy stream, then the audio flinger is like a server, uh, which is used, uh, and this does things like format conversion, sample rate conversion, if there's any processing required, and it does the mixing, and then it sends the data to the driver uh, using HAL. Uh, if MMAP is available, then it takes a different path, the, a audio would send the data uh, to to another service, which is the A audio service. And if the if the requested access mode is exclusive, then the MMAP stream can access the device buffer, the, the hardware device buffer, and directly. This will give the least amount of latency. If it's not in exclusive mode, then there is another mixer, the A, A audio mixer that's running, which also accesses the the driver using using a five uh, using an MMAP five four uh, transfers in uh, in OBO uh, involve uh, again the device reports progress which may come through an interrupt and then this gets sent up all the way to the application and the application gets a callback and whenever the application gets a callback it will also receive buffers which need to be filled or which contain data. And uh, note that this picture shows an ALSA driver, but it doesn't have to be an ALSA driver. It could be a proprietary driver, uh, but the hell is going to be common. Now, if you want to use uh, OBO, uh, which is what's recommended, uh, if you're doing low-level access uh, for audio, uh, the device discovery has to be first done via, via other interfaces such as Audio Manager. Uh, which provides a list of devices and information for each device. Uh, now, in order to, uh, to prepare for streaming, uh, you would need to use something called Audio Stream Builder. Uh, this, uh, on, on the Audio Stream Builder, you would set parameters such as uh, which device ID you want to use, the direction of transfer, uh, sharing or exclusive mode, sample rate, and you also provide a callback object. And, and again, here you need to, uh, and then you would uh, basically uh, create a stream with the, with the audio stream builder and then you would request start on all the streams or actually if you have two streams, record and playback. Uh, while things are streaming, once again, uh, you get the buffers that need to be filled. Uh, the buffers are provided in the callback or if it's capture, you read from the data. If this is the case of a full duplex where you've uh, uh, you want to both record and capture, you would typically set the callback only on, on the playback. And then in your callback, you would then uh, retrieve the captured data using, using, the, uh, using the read function. This is somewhat similar to the IO audio proc in macOS. Okay. Um, as you can see, the lower level APIs can get quite complex. And if you don't really need that complexity, then there are a number of soft software abstraction layers available. Some layers are provided as simplified APIs for specific tasks. Uh, there are other layers uh, which are uh, provided for cross-platform compatibility, so you don't need to write separate code for, for each platform. So uh, talking about uh, platform-specific layers, on Windows we have functions like message beep and play sound. Uh, you can use message beep to play a simple 
uh, or predefined sounds like a beep or alert. Uh, play sound can be used to play audio files, uh, buffers which contain audio, or resources that are embedded in your application. Uh, similarly, on Mac OS and iOS, uh, we have uh, NS beep and NS sound, which do similar things. Uh, uh, Mac OS also provides the whole AV Foundation framework and audio queue, uh, which provide a simpler way of playing, recording, and, and processing sounds if you don't want to uh, start using the lower layers. Um, on Linux uh, and, and also others, uh, you can, if you want to just sound a beep, you can uh, write an ASCII bell character on the terminal and it will beep. Uh, or, or you can invoke uh, if. Uh, uh, if needed, you can invoke the PA uh, play utility to play a specific files, if that's all what you need done. Um, now there are also uh, uh, cross-platform layers. Many of them are, are available. I'll just list a few of them uh, that I am familiar uh, with. First, there's Juice. It's, uh, it's a full-fledged cross-platform application framework, but it has a uh, very good focus for audio. Uh, it's modern, uh, C++ based, and has an extensive set of audio classes to do a lot of things that I just discussed. Uh, there's Port Audio, which is good. It's been there for a long time, but hasn't seen too much uh, active development lately. Uh, there's uh, Jack. Jack is primarily for Linux, but also works on other platforms. It's very simple to use API. <laughs> Uh, due to limited parameterization, but this is also very powerful. There is uh, OpenAL, uh, mainly for 3D localization used for gaming, although this may not be supported on some operating systems now. Uh, there are also libraries like SDL, LibSound Audio, SuperPower, and probably uh, others that I didn't list here. Okay, in, uh, as we've seen, all driver models and APIs have Similar goals, but they have different approaches. Uh, the choice of which API you want to use depends on what you want to achieve. Uh, it can depend on what type of application you are building. Is it a DAW, game, uh, synth, or for communication? Uh, what kind of platforms do you need to support? Uh, what are your performance and latency goals? Uh, what sort of devices you want to be compatible with? because you know, not all devices may have an ACO driver, for example. Um, and you know, if you have uh, needs for uh, the device to work in a specific format or any format, if you need uh, system-wide effects processing, uh, and, and of course, how much time and effort you want to spend coding the solution. Um, now, there are certain feature differences between APIs and driver models. I've tried to list a few of them here. Uh, you may want to consider these feature differences uh, when you want to choose what, uh, what driver model or API you want to use. Uh, if you need something like integrated uh, or automatic sample rate and format conversion, uh, then most of these APIs would work except for ASIO because uh, for an ASIO client, you have to, uh, you have to write in the format that's supported by the hardware uh, and usually doesn't provide sample rate conversion. If you want multi-client support, again, uh, you pr should probably not depend on ASIO. Although, as I said earlier, there are many ASIO drivers available now which do support this in one way or another. If you want to utilize system-wide effects processing that is available on the system, then Windows has something called APOs, uh, which are usually provided by the hardware vendor. Uh, Linux uh, also can provide this via, via ALSA plugins. Uh, if you need to use 3D localization uh, for gaming, for example, you'd use uh, X3D Audio OpenAL, or there's also the AV uh, Audio Environment node on AV Audio Player on, on Mac OS and iOS. Um, if having channel names is important for you, then you should use ASIO on Windows. Uh, Mac OS uh, also provides this feature. Uh, if you want to be able to control which clock sources the device works on, then again, there are, you know, ASIO and Mac OS provides this also, also provides this. Um, 
if you want integrated time code support, then ASIO and, and Mac OS Core Audio and probably iOS support that. Um, if you want uh, a device which, which has to be full duplex inherently, so you have a synchronous start stop, for example, then this is not supported by Windows uh, uh, driver models. Uh, you can need to use ASIO or, or Mac OS. Um, if you want the ability to uh, aggregate multiple devices and use it as a single device, uh, where the host chooses one device, but actually it is using a number of devices, then uh, this is supported by macOS Core Audio. It's also supported by Alsa, but not on other driver models. Uh, there are sometimes uh, security restrictions that you need to keep in mind. Uh, for example, uh, Windows requires if you have a, a driver that you need to run the kernel, then not only do you need to digitally sign it, the driver also has to be additionally attested by Microsoft. Uh, similarly, uh, on Apple platforms, uh, now uh, on Mac OS, it re requires not only digital signing, but also notarization, which also is now required for applications, uh, mostly. Um, if for Windows you need to be able to play protected content, then the driver also needs to be WHKL certified. Um, in addition, uh, for example, on Mac, uh, if you want to use the, if you want to capture audio, then you have to specify a purpose string saying, okay, I want to use uh, capture audio. Actually, you have to say you have to use a microphone. So, so these are certain things uh, that you may need to keep in mind. And um, there were uh, too many references to list here. So what I've done is I've created this, this Google Drive folder, which contains the PDF of this, of this presentation, and a file called References RTF, which contains uh, links to uh, documents and sample source code uh, related to most of what I've talked today. Um, and in addition to that, I received a lot of valuable help from uh, folks at Apple, Tony and Doug, uh, uh, provided a lot of good information, got information from Microsoft also, and, and also uh, Google, uh, Phil and, and Glenn provided uh, valuable information. For Linux, I got information from the author of Jack and Ardor, that's Paul. Uh, so yeah, I'm thankful to to all of you, and I think we have time for questions. Thanks, Devan. We have literally 30 seconds, so if only someone has a very quick question in mind, otherwise I think we really need to run for the, for the second session. Something very quick. Thanks for the info. I was wondering for macOS and Windows, how much of that is documented versus I'm sorry? how much of the architectures for win Windows and Mac are documented? Uh, they're mostly documented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's some yeah. 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 Or they have, okay. we have people from Apple here. You can ask them. But, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. But okay. yeah, the, I, I must say the, the IO model that I talked about, the, I have the documentation, some of it, because I've been writing drivers for a long time. So some of that information is actually pr present in old documents, which may not be easy to find. But I have links in the references where you can, where you can get that documentation. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs>